In this lecture on anticoagulation and fibrinolysis, we're going to essentially talk about why we don't turn into a giant blood clot. Um, and of course, a blood clot is a fibrin clot, and that is what coagulation does. And so all of these factors are procoagulants, and we have in our body anticoagulants, and we have things in our body that allow us to break up clots, and that is called fibrinolysis. So those are the two things we're going to talk about. We're also going to touch a little bit about the anticoagulants that we use in vitro to prevent blood clotting. And the body really tightly regulates coagulation. It's a balance between the procoagulant and anticoagulant forces and then fibrinolysis or fibrinolytic pathways. We're not going to go through all the details. We're just going to go through some of the general kind of categories so that you can diagnose the diseases in veterinary medicine. We're not going to go into the full complexity of coagulation and fibrinolysis. So we have several anticoagulants in the body and we're primarily going to talk about uh, antithrombin. And of course we've already talked about thrombin. More familiar name is factor 2. So factor 2 is also known as thrombin. And so prothrombin is actually kind of the precursor to factor 2. So antithrombin is a big anticoagulant in the body. Again, it works against thrombin, so it's nicely named. Other anticoagulants include intact endothelium. Of course, because you have hidden away von Willebrand's factor and other um, substances that increase coagulation. Uh, there are two vitamin K factors, really, or dependent factors, protein C and S. We're not going to talk about those a lot. And then there's many others. Uh, so let's talk about antithrombin. And again, it's going to work against thrombin, preventing the conversion of fibrin into fibrin. Why we care about antithrombin, so it's antithrombin 3, or people call it uh, just antithrombin. I'm just going to abbreviate it AT for our purposes. So it is similarly sized to albumin. And why that is important um, is because when albumin's lost, especially chronic cases of loss of albumin, which we haven't really gone over that yet very much, we will in the protein section and in the renal section. So when you lose albumin chronically, and so since these are similarly sized, you're also going to lose antithrombin. And the big diseases where you lose antithrombin are something called protein losing, or where you lose thrombin and albumin, are protein losing nephropathy. And this is actually a disease of the renal, the glomerulus, and it allows too much albumin to get through. And there's actually a variety of causes um, that we will not actually go into at all in this class, um, aside from the general categories. And the other is protein losing enteropathy. And that's usually where you have some sort of kind of severe infiltrative or inflammatory small bowel disease that doesn't allow for absorption of albumin and globulin. So in this case, both albumin and globulin decrease, where in protein losing nephropathy, only albumin decreases. And how you would identify that is that there would be a lot of protein in the urine when you actually look at the protein dipstick. Uh, it would be usually at least a 3 plus or a 4 plus without any evidence of hemoglobin or blood or anything else. So we'll talk more about that. And the last way that antithrombin decreases, so we care about decreased levels of antithrombin, is when it's consumed. And it's consumed in um, the syndrome known as disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, which we'll talk about in a separate video. So just to tell you a little bit a little bit more about anticoagulants in vitro, this is what we use in veterinary medicine to collect blood, and I don't know where else you get it in the curriculum, so I thought I would have it here. So to do tests such as uh, CBCs, we do we use EDTA, and that's an anticoagulant, meaning that the blood right it does not clot, so it stays as whole blood, and EDTA actually works by it chelates calcium. And it does so um, 
irreversibly. And that's um, in contrast to the blue top tube, which is a citrate tube. So it contains citrate as the anticoagulant. So our blood stays whole. And it, we mostly do for coag testing. And the reason we can use it for coag testing is because it also chelates calcium, but it does so reversibly, meaning that we add calcium back into the system in our reagents and it works just fine. So that's for coags. EDTA is for things like CBCs, blood typing, etc. Uh, we also have um, heparin tubes, which are green top tubes. And some places um, you do this for blood gas, and you can also even do it for some chemistry tests. And this actually works by it works against factor 10. You don't have to know that. So that works against factor 10. You cannot read my writing, but we'll just put 10 there. And so that leaves blood whole. So the red top tube, so that's our red top or serum top, and it does not contain anticoagulant, which means the blood should clot in it. So you should get a nice clot of blood, and when you spin it down, um, you'll have serum. So your serum would be here, right? So that would be your serum. These guys, if you spin them down, you still get a product, but it's plasma. And of course, we talked about the difference a little bit between plasma and serum. We use uh, serum mostly for chemistry tests and endocrine tests, so like thyroid panels um, and things like that. So now let's talk about fibrinolysis. So at the same time that the body actually is injured and the tissue is damaged, so here we have damaged tissue, that's a, a dog foot, um, due to some sort of tissue injury, and the body actually activates the clotting cascade, the tissues also release something called tissue plasminogen activator. And I'm not gonna write that out because I can't seem to write tonight. And tissue plasminogen activator, um, combines with something from the liver called plasminogen. So the liver makes normally makes plasminogen and it circulates in the body normally. And it's essentially just waiting to be activated by tissue plasminogen activator. And when these two meet, they make something called plasmin. And plasmin allows for the cleavage of uh, fibrin. So the role of plasmin is to essentially break up clots, and it does that by going to fibrin and cleaving it. And there's two forms of fibrin. One is non-cross-linked, which we call soluble fibrin, and the other one is cross-linked fibrin, which is also considered insoluble fibrin. And when fibrin's actually broken down, you get different products, and these are called uh, fibrin degradation products, or FDPs. And they form when soluble fibrin is broken down, but they also form, and this is, sorry about the messy arrows, when fibrinogen's broken down. So FDPs aren't really specific for any sort of clot production, because if you have increased amounts of fibrinogen, even without clots, FDPs are gonna increase. So many years ago, they discovered that there's a special breakdown product when insoluble fibrin clots are degraded, and it's a special type of FDP, and it's called a D-dimer. So D-dimers and high levels of FDPs, so when they're in very high levels, tells you that there's increased clot formation, so fibrin clot formation, and breakdown. And that happens in certain diseases. And the general categories include a loss of anticoagulant, right? So that might be a loss of antithrombin. And the other is going to be where you have um, that thing called DIC, or disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. And the next video is going to be entirely dedicated to that because it's kind of important and a little confusing.